A mental disorder within the Canadian criminal justice system is defined in the criminal code as a disease of the mind. An individual charged with a criminal offense who has been found to suffer from a mental disorder by a mental health professional, however, is not necessarily exempt from criminal responsibility. There have been many accused who suffer from a mental illness who have been tried and convicted. The not criminally responsible defense is rarely used in Canada because it's rarely successful in court. In most cases, the defense of not criminally responsible is immediately rejected by the court. A defendant is basically admitting the actions, but not the crimes. As lawyers representing such cases often say, this is not a whodunit. Instead, trials about this unusual verdict are usually contests of expert witness psychiatrists. It's usually reserved for the most severe cases of mental illness, primarily people who are schizophrenic. Because the NCR verdict results in no jail sentence and the impression that no crime has been committed, this verdict has also become a highly politicized area of criminal law. The argument behind this law is that people who are punished for crimes in Canada must have an understanding that what they did was wrong. If mental illness left them unable to have this moral insight, then they are simply not guilty under the law. People who are found not criminally responsible don't go to prison. Instead, they go into the Provincial Review Board system with regular supervision. They are typically confined to hospitals for an indeterminate period. Piedmont is a small municipality in Quebec, Canada, in the heart of the Laurentian Mountains. With a population of about 3,500 people, it is located along the North River, about 60 kilometers north of Montreal. Piedmont is a town for those who love the outdoors. Tourists enjoy downhill and cross-country skiing in the winter, and during the summer months, the region offers tubing, biking, golfing, and hiking. On February 21st, 2009, the tiny community was shaken by the tragic killing of two small children in what looked like a double murder attempted suicide. Even more shocking was their parents were both doctors at St. Jerome's Hospital, and their father, Guy Turcotte, a cardiologist, was the suspect. The children's mother, Isabel Gaston, was away on a skiing vacation in the Saguenay area about 250 kilometers north of Quebec City. Just the night before, Guy Tocotte's mother, Marguerite Fournier, had called him around 8.30 p.m. because she was worried. She hadn't heard from him in almost a week and noticed that her son's voice was quiet. He told his mother his life was destroyed because Isabel had met another man and said that life was hell and he had been unhappy for the past 10 years. His mother thought he might have been drinking because his words were slurred. He also jumped from one regret to another during this conversation. He told his mother that he loved her and started naming off his five siblings and said he loved them as well. Marguerite told her son she knew things were difficult, but he was tired and should rest. He would feel better in the morning. But after hanging up, she sensed that something wasn't right. She remembered hearing somewhere that people who wanted to kill themselves often make a point of telling people they love them. Early the next morning on February 21st, 2009, a worried and sleep-deprived Marguerite Fournier called her son. But when Turcotte didn't answer his phone, his parents feared the worst and made the drive up north to Piedmont. When they arrived at their son's home, Turcotte's car was parked outside. There was fresh snow that fell the night before and no car tracks or footprints in it. A light was on in the upstairs bedroom. The blinds were drawn and no one responded to loud knocking at the door or the doorbell. Eventually, Marguerite Fournier would call 911 as she stood outside her son's locked home and told the dispatcher that her 36-year-old son was locked inside the house with two young children. Il était bien découragé. J'ai jasé longtemps avec lui au téléphone. J'ai espéré que toutes les choses aillent bien. Ce matin, on a essayé d'appeler, puis ça répondait pas. C'est qu'on s'est rendu à la maison. Tout est euh, fermé. Il n'y a rien qui bouge là. Son char est là. Euh, C'est que euh, 
il était en grande difficulté, il était dans la désolation. Il m'a dit plusieurs fois, « Maman, je t'aime, dis à papa que je l'aime. Euh, » Il nommait ses frères et sœurs un après l'autre, il disait, « Dis-leur que je les aime. » Euh, puis, euh, d'après moi, il avait bu, okay. euh, parce que c'était pas euh, sa, conversa sa, euh, sa façon de parler habituelle. Là. Sir Ted du Québec officer Patrick Bigra and Marc Antoine responded to the 911 call. They arrived just after 11 a.m. and got into the house through a window. Once inside, they heard a loud sound from the upper floor. The horrific scene they discovered forced Bigra, an officer with 12 years experience, to take a two and a half month leave of absence from work to cope with post-traumatic stress disorder. Once they were upstairs, they made a grisly discovery. There was blood on the bathroom door, and in their bedrooms were the deceased bodies of Oliver and Anne Sophie Turcotte in their beds. The scene was a mess, a combination of blood and vomit everywhere. There was a glass containing something liquid on the dresser and a plastic four liter jug about one eighth full of windshield fluid sat on the edge of the tub. Oliver, age five, was lying on his back on his bed covered in blood and his stomach had been mutilated. He weighed 64 pounds and was stabbed 27 times. Anne Sophie was in a similar position. She weighed 36 pounds with stab wounds to her stomach and chest. Strands of her own hair were found in her tiny fists. According to the coroner, she was tearing at her own hair as her father stabbed her 19 times. Two knives were found at the scene. A small one beside the bathtub and a longer one on Oliver's bed. In the master bedroom, Patrick Begras looked under the bed and found the children's father. Turcotte was on his back. He said he had taken Valium and told the police to go away. He wanted to die. One of the paramedics, Bertrand Rochon, who was called to the scene, said that Turcotte's eyes were closed, but he could answer questions. As he was wheeled into the emergency ward of the hospital, where he worked as a cardiologist, Guy Turcotte covered his head with a blanket. But this didn't prevent a nursing assistant, Stefan Gagnon, from recognizing him. The emergency room doctor on duty that day, Mary Pierre Chartrand, was in denial a few seconds. They had been notified in advance by an ambulance technician that they were bringing in a man who attempted suicide and who had may have killed two children. When Chartrand saw Turcotte, the cardiologist from the same hospital where she worked, she couldn't believe her eyes. At the hospital, Turcotte said that he had taken Tylenol and drank two liters of windshield washer fluid. Although blood tests would later show that he had lied to staff and had not taken Tylenol as he claimed. Stefan Gagnon said that Turcotte threw up several times during the first half hour at the hospital, was nervous and crying, and also overheard Turcotte say to Sûreté du Québec investigators, I killed my children, I killed my children. And strangely enough, he was still obsessing over his wife, who had left him for another man telling the emergency room manager, quote, if you only knew what she put me through. He again begged another emergency room nurse, Chantelle Duhamel, to let him die, that he didn't want medical treatment because he was a criminal, and said that he killed his children because he didn't want them to suffer from the separation. He cried, but was coherent and recognized his co-worker. He would eventually be transferred to another hospital in Montreal partially because St. Jerome's staff felt there was a conflict of interest in taking care of one of their own doctors, and partially because they didn't want him there. Given the circumstances, they felt a mixture of shock and disgust towards him, and felt they couldn't do their jobs and provide the best medical care. By the time he was transferred, eight hours had passed since his mother had called the police. He remained in stable condition, and although he was unable to appear in court, he was quickly charged with first-degree murder in the deaths of his children. Guy Turcotte was born in April 1972. He met Isabel Gaston in a Quebec City bar in 1999. Both were doctors at St. Jerome Hospital in Quebec. Gaston worked as an emergency room physician and coroner, and Turcotte was a cardiologist. They moved in together in the year 2000. 
but their relationship became hostile and Turcotte would eventually move out. However, they would eventually reconcile and promise to work on their relationship. But their relationship never improved. And things only got worse after Oliver was born in 2003 and Anne-Sophie in 2005. Isabel tried everything to improve their marriage, from reading self-help books to going to therapy. But twice she found images of gay pornography on Turcotte's laptop. The first time in 2001 and again in 2008. Finally, she suggested to her husband that he explore his sexuality. His response was not what she expected. He got really angry and said that he wasn't gay and to stop suggesting that he was. She gave up trying shortly after that. In October of 2008, after five years of marriage, Isabel had an affair. Isabel Gaston and Guy Turcotte often socialized outside of the gym with their personal trainers, Martin Hewitt and Patricia Giro. The couples rang in 2009 together. But Patricia started getting a nagging suspicion that something was going on between her husband and Isabel. After snooping through her husband's emails, her suspicions were confirmed. Patricia told Turcotte just weeks before the family left on a week-long vacation in Mexico, and Patricia said that Turcotte reacted with both confusion and frustration when she showed him the emails. Completely devastated, Turcotte decided not to let this ruin the trip. However, while they were in Cancun, Isabel learned through an email from Martin that Turcotte knew everything. And according to Patricia, when the couple returned from Mexico, Turcotte looked like he hadn't slept in days. After this, things declined rapidly and the couple separated. Turcotte ended up punching Martin in the face on February 10th, inside the house he and Isabel used to share, and burst in again only 10 days later. And just days before leaving for her skiing vacation, Guy and Isabel had a particularly nasty phone conversation when he said to her, quote, You want war? I'll give you war. Isabel had never heard him so angry before, but she thought he was referring to money. She never thought for a second that he would hurt the children. He was described as an attentive father who took care of the kids, preparing their snacks, and playing games. She tried calling him back several times to smooth things over, but only got his voicemail. When the couple separated after returning from Mexico, Turcotte rented a house in Piedmont two months before the murders took place and had shared custody. He had only signed a three-month lease for the home because he had purchased a home in mid-February of 2009 and was set to attend an inspection on February 21st, 2009. But on February 20th, he was furious with Isabel for changing the locks on the house, even though they were separated. He felt she had no right to do this because he was still part owner of the property. Guy picked up the children from school that day. As he drove, he thought Hewitt seemed to be taking his place as their father too. Hewitt had gone with the children to the Quebec Winter Carnival and the neighbors told him that Hewitt seemed to have moved in through the back door as Turcotte left through the front. A little after 4 p.m., Turcotte turned into Video Zone's parking lot, and surveillance cameras captured what turned out to be the final images of the children. He made them dinner while they watched Kalu, and around 6 p.m. put them to bed. Afterwards, he started sorting through the multiple emails that his wife and Hewitt had sent each other during the family's Mexican vacation. In some of these emails, Isabel expressed fear that Hewitt's ex, Patricia, would hurt her. As it turns out, Isabel was worried about the wrong person. Around 7 p.m. on February 20th, Turcotte started searching the internet for ways to kill himself. About 8.30 the previous evening, Turcotte had left a message with his real estate agent cancelling his appointment. He also cancelled the babysitter. The last straw occurred on the day of the killings, when Turcotte learned that Isabel was planning a girl's skiing weekend. Anne blew up at her when she announced that she had changed the locks. The next morning, both children were found stabbed to death. Isabel, in the meantime, had no idea any of this had occurred. It wasn't until 7 p.m. the next evening, when she was out for pre-dinner drinks with friends, that she happened to notice multiple missed calls from her sister and several frantic voicemails. 
Her sister and emergency officers had to break the news to her over the phone. She then had to make the three-hour drive from the ski resort to the Sûreté de Quebec St. Jérôme's police station. Police initially thought she had been murdered as well, but then subjected her to five hours of questioning. She was understandably devastated. The children's funeral featured a balloon release, depicting Dora the Explorer and Lightning McQueen from the movie Cars. Guy Turcotte refused to pay for the children's funerals. He also instructed his parents to withdraw the remaining $1,200 from the bank account he shared with Isabel. He then drew up a detailed list of items he wanted retrieved from the Piedmont home, including a bag of potatoes, which is incredibly random. He removed Isabel as the beneficiary of his life insurance and from his will. He stopped all pre-authorized withdrawals from his bank account and spoke to his financial advisor about adjusting his RRSP portfolio to a less risky investment. He had also asked his parents to reclaim a gift certificate to a spa and concert tickets he had given Isabel for Christmas, saying that someone in his own family should enjoy them, not her. Remember, a week earlier, he had just slaughtered his children. Apparently money was his main concern. He needed to pay a team of lawyers for his criminal defense, his divorce, and dismissal from the College of Physicians and Surgeons, and to halt the purchase of the house he bought just days before killing his own children. A few months later, on May 17, 2009, Isabel was deeply depressed. She felt she could no longer live without her children and was considering suicide. But at the same time, she wanted to know one thing. Why did Guy murder the children? Against police advice, Gaston called the Pinal Institute where Guy was being held and was surprised when she was transferred directly to Guy, who at first wouldn't speak with her, saying, quote, I'm not supposed to talk to you, but what do you want? She told him she didn't want to be separated from the children and about her thoughts of suicide. And Turcotte told her that when he tried to kill himself, he wasn't able to find the courage to go through with it. After pouring her feelings about her children's death onto paper, she came to the conclusion that Turcotte had killed them to get back at her, and that if he had killed her instead of the children, she would have wanted them to go on without her and live happy, full lives. She wouldn't have wanted them to be depressed. She decided she had to live for them and to make a difference in other children's lives. Every year, she marks their birthday with a trip to a place they would have liked. While Guy Turcotte was in jail awaiting trial, he couldn't resist stirring up some drama. In November 2009, he was once again hospitalized after a second suicide attempt. He was hoarding his daily medication and took it all in one gulp. Confident he finally figured out a way to end things, but once again failed. He was found heavily intoxicated in his prison cell. Doctors pumped his stomach and he was returned to prison where he was under 24-hour watch. His preliminary hearing began on February of 2010, and after one year of trial delays and two years since the actual murders, jury selection finally began on Friday, April 8, 2011. Needless to say, finding an impartial jury was going to be difficult. Out of the first 400 people who appeared in Superior Court, only nine were told to come back. Several potential jurors asked to be excused because they couldn't understand how someone could kill children. Guy Turcotte would plead not guilty to two counts of first-degree murder, and 29 witnesses were expected to be called to testify. From the very beginning of the trial of Guy Turcotte, it was not about if he killed his children. We know he did. What we didn't know was why. Was it malice or mental illness? Was he too mentally ill to know what he was doing? It was clear from the beginning the defense was pushing for a not criminally responsible verdict. Presiding over the trial was Superior Court Justice Mark David, and representing Turcotte were two brothers, defense lawyers Guy and Pierre Popart. In opening statements, Crown Prosecutor Claudia Carboneau told the jury to listen closely to every witness because each could provide a piece of the puzzle and said the central question will be quote what was the state of mind of the accused at the time of the tragedy p 
Pierre Popart said in his opening statement that his client was not criminally responsible for the death of his children because he was unable to understand the consequences of his actions at the time of the killing. There was no question, Turcotte stabbed his two young children. But what the jury had to determine was did he know what he was doing? Crime scene specialist Daniel Fortin entered 157 photos of the crime scene, revealing a horrific aftermath of what took place that evening. Among the door of the Explorer carpet, rocking chair, and children's clothing were spatters and smears of red. The police who responded to the scene that day were also called to testify. Provincial police officer Patrick Bigra told the court about discovering the children in their beds. He went into the master bedroom and looked under the bed and saw a man who was squirming. Officer Bigra called him an idiot and the man, who was Guy Turcotte, responded, quote, I know. Officer Bigra testified that the man was semi-conscious and seemed lucid. The court also heard from Turcotte's mother, who described her son as a caring, patient father who loved his children but who had suffered the insult of insults, the loss of all dignity, when his marriage fell apart. Bertrand Rachon, the paramedic who responded to the Turcotte home, testified that Turcotte was able to respond to questions and said that Turcotte knew what he had done. Remember, finding a defendant not criminally responsible is incredibly difficult. The burden is on the accused to prove he wasn't aware of his actions. Already, early in the trial, we can see this isn't the case with Turcotte on the day of the murders. He was completely aware, lucid, and answering questions before arriving at the hospital. And at the hospital, he seemed completely aware of his actions, telling Sûreté de Québec officers, quote, I killed my children, I killed my children. Gillian Paquin, the emergency room manager, testified that Turcotte was obsessing over his wife as he laid in a hospital bed after killing his two children and drinking two liters of windshield wiper fluid. She held his hand as he spoke about his failed marriage. Quote, he said she had everything she wanted, did everything she wanted, and traveled wherever she wanted. She said Turcotte cried, but was coherent and recognized his colleagues. After 13 days of heart-wrenching testimony from 26 witnesses, the Crown wrapped up its case. The defense began its case by presenting photos, depicting Turcotte as a doting, loving father, attempting to paint a picture of a man who adored his two children, and that he could not have been within his right mind when he killed them. Defense attorney Pierre Popart said he would present evidence that Turcotte suffered from a mental disorder, and then Guy Turcotte took the stand in his own defense. He told the court about his rocky six-year marriage to Isabel, and that after learning his wife was having an affair with a mutual friend, he was devastated. In the days leading up to the murders, he grew increasingly angry towards his wife, and fearful of losing his children in the hours before he killed them. Quote, Isabel said to stop controlling her life, and she said she could change the children's names and move with them anywhere in Quebec. After three days on the stand, he talked about the night of the stabbing. That evening, he put the children to bed and then read a string of emails between his wife and Martin Hewitt. He said he doesn't remember everything that happened, but before killing his children, Turcotte said he sat on the bed with a glass in one hand and a jug of windshield wiper fluid in the other. He didn't remember calling the real estate agent to cancel the appointment or calling the babysitter to say she wouldn't be needed. And the hour-long conversation he had with his mother seemed to last seconds, he said. He said he realized while drinking the windshield fluid he was dying, but he didn't want his children to wake up and find him dead. So he decided to, quote, take them with me. And after he killed them, he sat in his bathroom, drinking more windshield wiper fluid. This was apparently the last thing he remembered. The next morning, Turcotte woke up to the sounds of police inside the house. Psychiatrist Dominique Bourget, who was an expert in family violence, testified for the defense. She also sat on the commission who annually reviewed cases of people found not criminally responsible for their crimes because of mental illness and recommended conditions for their release. 
She testified that Guy Turcotte was in the midst of severe mental illness triggered by his marital breakdown. She said that Turcotte was suffering from an adjustment disorder that caused him to lose touch with reality and that he wasn't suffering from schizophrenia, psychosis, manic depression, or personality disorder the night he killed his children. According to Ross Hugo Bouchard, another psychiatrist who testified for the defense, the reason Turcotte stabbed his children to death was that, quote, he just couldn't take it anymore. He came to this conclusion after spending a whole two hours with Turcotte, and according to his expert testimony, the night Guy Turcotte killed his children, he was, quote, exhausted, sad, and weak. It was the accumulation of everything on his shoulders. The prosecution wasn't falling for it, though. They wanted to know if Guy Turcotte was so depressed and lethargic in the days before he killed his children, where did he find the energy to buy a house, go to work, rent a truck, exercise, and move his things from the family home? To which the psychiatrist responded, he was trying to control his suffering and pain. In closing argument, defense counsel Pierre Popart said Guy Turcotte was a sick man who had lost all reason. He was too mentally ill to know what he was doing and therefore should not be held criminally responsible for the killings. Isabel Gaston was disgusted with the defense tactics and stormed out of the courtroom during closing arguments. And I can't say I blame her. I understand it's a defense attorney's job to vigorously defend their client, but at the same time, he repeatedly pointed out the number of times Turcotte stabbed the children and said this was not the mark of a rational normal person. It seemed to cross a line. Prosecutor Claudia Carboneau said that Turcotte was fully coherent before and after the deaths. Despite his turbulent mental state and the windshield wiper fluid he ingested, she pointed out when the police entered his home, they found him intoxicated but coherent. Quote, he answered their questions. He was verbally active. He said, I killed my children. I'm a criminal. And she argued, despite the anguish he felt as his marriage to Isabel fell apart, he was capable of empathy and reason. Before the killings, he made two calls to cancel his appointments, and he told his mother he loved her on the phone as he waited to die. And now the case went to the jury, who had been sequestered for the past 10 weeks, which is highly unusual. But then this was an unusual, highly emotional case. And the judge gave clear instructions. He said the jury must agree on Turcotte's motive, which is an odd instruction. In NCR cases, it doesn't matter why someone is committing the crime, just whether they understand that what they're doing is wrong. In one of Canada's more famous NCR verdicts, Vince Lee was a very ill schizophrenic who was convinced voices from the sun were telling him he was the Chinese Jesus. These same voices would eventually tell him to kill Tim McLean on a Greyhound bus on the Trans-Canada Highway. By the time he snapped and killed Tim, he was speaking gibberish and mutilating Tim's body on the bus. I won't go into too much detail, I did a whole other video about that case which I'll link down below, but for the record, Vince Lee was a very ill man and I still don't agree with that verdict. But in Turcotte's case, the judge didn't seem to indicate in his instructions to the jury that if Guy was aware that what he was doing was wrong, he couldn't be held not criminally responsible. No one was ready for what would come next. The jury of seven women and four men deliberated for five days. And on July 5th, 2011, they returned with their verdict of not criminally responsible. Guy Turcotte would be heading to a mental hospital, not a prison. He would remain at the Philip Pinal Institute, home to 300 patients, until he was examined by a special psychiatrist panel to determine if he now posed a threat to public safety. Half the people in the courtroom let out a sigh of relief, and the other half sat there in stunned shock. Needless to say, this wasn't the verdict Isabel Gaston expected, saying that she felt betrayed by the jury who believed Turcotte's mental disorder defense. And in her eyes, no adult has the right to determine the life and death of children. Reaction to the verdict from the public was pretty much what you can imagine, 
Most people were outraged by the outcome. They just weren't buying his story that depression caused him to kill and that he was most likely fueled by rage and a desire for revenge. And this case also called into question the erosion of personal responsibility for one's behavior and how egocentric it was of him to think the children would be better off dead than shared custody with their mother. So that's it, right? The trial's over. He got away with it. Not exactly. In Canada, if someone is found not guilty of an offense or not criminally responsible, double jeopardy laws apply. They can't be tried for the same crime twice, except for one tiny little loophole. The Crown has the option to appeal the verdict to the Provincial Court of Appeals, similar to people who have been convicted of a crime. Now that being said, the Crown's right to appeal are very restricted, much more restricted than a defendant's. A prosecutor just can't appeal a verdict because they didn't get the outcome they wanted. To appeal an acquittal or an NCR verdict, the Crown must show there was significant error of law that had a substantial impact on the verdict. More often than not, these appeals fail, but it was an option the prosecution had and was being pressured by the public to use. Many people voiced concerns that the Turcotte verdict set a dangerous precedent, giving spouses in contentious partnerships permission to go on killing sprees and then claim they didn't know what they were doing. Meanwhile, on August 12, 2011, Guy Turcotte faced his first mental health review with a board panel, who would rule on the degree of danger that Turcotte represented for society. Because of the widespread public interest in the case, the panel was made up of five professionals instead of the usual three, including two lawyers, two psychiatrists, and one social worker. The panel would have to decide if Turcotte would be discharged conditionally discharged absolutely, or remain detained. After an intense panel review, they recommended that Turcotte be kept for another year at the Pinal Institute. Meanwhile, the Crown announced it would be seeking an appeal of the verdict, after legal analysis found the judge may have erred in his instructions to the jury. A committee of experts had reviewed Quebec Superior Court Justice Mark David's charge to the jury, and quote, contends that the judge erred in law on points susceptible of influencing the jury in its conclusion of not criminally responsible for the reason of mental problems. Few verdicts in Quebec had provoked such a passionate public response. Radio call-in shows, letters to the editor, and online sites were filled with outraged rants from Canadians, unable to grasp why a man who admitted to stabbing his two children to death would not be locked up in prison forever. By January of 2012, Turcotte said he believed he was better now and said he feels less shame, less guilt, and has more self-esteem and is ready to be released. And by June of 2012, Guy Turcotte was granted supervised outings, accompanied by a family member or an employee of the Pinal Institute. Oddly enough though, Psychiatric experts couldn't find anything specifically wrong with Turcotte or anything that had changed substantially that would guarantee he wouldn't snap again when faced with stress. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin with a case that has puzzled and outraged many people in this country. Today's release of a Quebec man who killed his two children less than four years ago. Guy Turcotte stabbed them to death but was found not criminally responsible, which means he is now a free man. His ex-wife says it makes no sense, and many agree with her. We have two reports tonight, beginning with Mike Armstrong in Montreal. This has been home for Guy Turcotte for 17 months, a psychiatric institute. While the media staked it out today, the institute will not confirm whether Turcotte is still inside, but he is free to leave. It's news that has left more than a little frustration in its wake. It was a jury that found the former cardiologist not criminally responsible, but it was a panel of mental health experts that decided unanimously he's no longer an immediate or short-term danger to society and can be released. Finally, in March of 2013, it was announced that the appeals court would be hearing the Crown's appeal of the Guy Turcotte case. At this point, Turcotte was on conditional release from the Pinal Institute. The conditions being he had to continue with his psychotherapy treatment, keep the peace, 
and refrained from contacting his ex-wife or her family. In the 28-page document to support the Crown's appeal and ask for a new trial, Prosecutor Michael Pinot claims Superior Court Justice Mark David erred in offering the jury the option of not criminally responsible and said that it should have never been an option in the first place. Not criminally responsible means the person is incapable of knowing that the act was wrong. Mental illness such as depression mixed in with intoxication can't lead one to conclude there was a mental defect if the intoxication was voluntary and contributed to the accused inability to know what he was doing. But Turcotte's defense team argued that it didn't matter whether his incapacity was caused by intoxication or mental illness and planned to argue that there should not be a new trial or if a new trial was ordered, it should be for manslaughter. The decision to retry Guy Turcotte would be up to a panel of three judges. And then on November 14, 2013, two years after being found not criminally responsible for his children's death, and almost one year after being released from a mental hospital, Guy Turcotte got the news that he was heading back to prison, or jail at least. The Quebec Court of Appeals overturned the jury's verdict and ordered a new trial, saying that although Justice Mark David faced a difficult task, the appeals court found that his instructions were faulty and as a result likely had a significant impact on the verdict. What does this mean for you uh, in terms of, I mean, starting this process all over again? Uh, you will undoubtedly be a, a witness in, in the new trial. Yeah. Um, wh what, what does that mean for you? I try to be here now in the present and not doing uh, idea in, in, in advance. That's the different that I, I used to do uh, maybe in the past, uh, waiting for an answer, waiting for uh, uh, an issue that I, I put in my head. But um, when you're a parent, when you're a mother, you find a, strong, a stringness that you didn't think you had. So sometimes I say it's crazy, but when I wake up in the morning, I, I don't feel that I have the right to let down my children. I don't feel that I can let go this responsibility even if they died. So maybe that's where I, I, I take my strength and in the value that I have that I think that we cannot kill someone and be free. Guy Turcotte turned himself in right away after an arrest warrant was issued, but he wasn't going down without a fight. In early January of 2014, his lawyer Pierre Popart announced he was filing a request with the Supreme Court of Canada seeking to squash the Quebec Court of Appeals decision. Fortunately, the Supreme Court of Canada made a decision quickly and refused to hear the case. Guy Turcotte would be going back on trial for murder. However, the prosecution announced early on that the retrial wouldn't begin before the fall of 2015 and possibly early 2016. But Turcotte wasn't happy waiting in jail until his new trial began. In September of 2014, his lawyer submitted a motion to free him until his new trial started. His bail hearing was just gross. Never mind this guy slaughtered two children under the age of five. Family members praised Turcotte, who up until his rearrest lived full time with elderly relatives, cooking for them and helping them around the house. They also said that before the Court of Appeals decision, he had no sign of depression. But coincidentally, after the decision, he needed antidepressants and was very anxious. He also argued that being in prison was a waste of his time, when he could be more useful caring for his elderly aunt and uncle and tending to their yard. The Crown, of course, was against his release, saying this was one of the worst crimes imaginable. It was the murder of two children who were stabbed many times by their father, in their home where they should have felt safe. But once again, a judge sided with the accused and released her caught on a $100,000 bail with conditions. This decision infuriated Patrick Gaston, Isabel's brother. He stormed out of the courtroom in a rage before the judge had even finished reading his decision. <laughs> Pour des imbéciles, 
puis de dire, de laisser un meurtrier sortir après 47 coups de couteau, qui n'est pas dangereux, mais moi, je ne fermerai pas les yeux. C'est spontané, mais de, la de laisser ça transposer, que l'accusé ait plus de droits que les victimes, puis que les familles, mais moi, on me remet en prison, là, là, aujourd'hui, en le laissant sortir. Le doute raisonnable qui s'en prenne à, à ma famille, il est là, puis il subsiste. Il va falloir qu'il reste en dedans, chez son oncle, parce qu'il veut sortir en tant qu'aide naturel, il sort, il est correct, puis là, il n'est pas correct. Mais laisser une chance, puis me, me redonner foi à notre système de justice, ils viennent tous de me perdre. Fait que si vous pensez que je vais me fermer les yeux, puis je vais me fermer la, la bouche aujourd'hui, non. J'ai aucun, aucune foi, non. Quand c'est le temps de, de, de faire face à la justice, ah, oh, il est tout correct. Mais ça, là, la lumière s'allume, la lumière euh, se ferme. C'est peut-être bon pour tous les experts de la planète, mais pour moi qui l'ai côtoyé pendant 10 ans, ça ne passe pas et ça ne passera jamais. Guy Turcotte's retrial began on September 23, 2015, and lasted for two months. When the jury was finally handed the case, they took their job seriously. After the first day of deliberations, they asked to see a copy of Section 16 of the Criminal Code which explains the NCR verdict. They also asked for a copy of Section 235, which explains that in Canada, everyone who commits first-degree murder and second-degree murder is guilty of an indictable offense. After being out for three days, the jury asked to review the psychiatrist's testimony. In total, the jury will be out for seven days before coming back with a verdict of guilty for second-degree murder. Guy Turcotte was handed a life sentence, with the possibility of parole after serving 17 years. Following the verdict, Isabel was emotional outside the courtroom. I was relief. I was uh, in shock. Uh, I, w I would have liked to stand up and say thank you to that, all of that, those jury. Um, I'm more in peace with life now. And for me, maybe the, I can rest and stop to battle, yeah. My situation is not different from many Quebecers and Canadians. And I think that if we had accepted this, this uh, violence, um, it would have been a, a big error, yeah. And I, I think that we, we, we can help people that are in uh, distress uh, or are having a, a, ro a rude uh, period in their life. But I think over that, we, we have to respect life. And for me, it, it's not only my battle, it was the battle of everyone. I always saw it like that. Because when you think about it, I don't have any children anymore. I, I, I have lost my children. I have lived the first verdict and now I'm living the second one. Tomorrow, I will not wake up with children. But everyone around us could be in that situation. So for the rare people that could use violence to, uh, to put an end in their situation, I think it, it's a good message to send to them to say we don't, we don't accept that. Yeah. Turcotte, of course, appealed both the verdict and his parole eligibility, but it didn't go anywhere. The Quebec Court of Appeals rejected both his claims. On June 20th, 2016, according to the Montreal Gazette, Turcotte was assaulted by fellow inmates at the Port Cartier Penitentiary. Apparently convicts don't take too kindly to child killers. Welcome back to CTV News Channel. I'm Anita Sharma. A former Quebec cardiologist who murdered his two children has reportedly been assaulted in prison. Several media reports say Guy Turcotte was beaten by fellow inmates at the Port Cartier Penitentiary near Cetille, Quebec. He suffered minor injuries, but he was admitted to the prison infirmary. Turcotte was recently transferred to the maximum security facility. He declined to file a police complaint. Turcotte was convicted in December of fatally stabbing his two children back in 2009. Thank you so much for watching and taking the time to hang out with me today. If you enjoyed learning about this case, please be sure to like and subscribe. If there's a case you would like me to cover in a future video, let me know down below in the comments section. To support my channel, you can go to buy me a coffee if you would like to donate. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.